Let me pause just to once again reaffirm what Keith said earlier about this coming uh, Sunday is Youth Rally, first of all. We hope you're all here for that. And then about the trip to Noah's Ark. It is fantastic, people. You've got to sign up for that. You say, but it costs a little bit of money. There are people here, including me, who are willing to help subsidize, and I mean it, your trip to help you make it. You gotta go. It's fantastic. You will love it. You will learn so much, as well as being thrilled by the magnificent exhibits, better than anything at Disney World or Epcot Center or SeaWorld or all those other things, because this is the truth. And we really encourage you to sign up for that. There's a sign up sheet there. There's a t-shirt sheet for those of you who are coming to the youth rally, or even if you don't come, be sure to order one. Uh, we love to have you along. Then, let me emphasize again about tonight. We have a, a film, Faith of Our Fathers, a fantastic film. Uh, you will love it. Folks, I would like you so much to see it. I personally paid $110 for the license to show it tonight. So please don't disappoint me. Please don't let me down. Please be here and see it. You will be blessed. All right, now take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we looked at just a few moments ago over in Proverbs chapter 2. Last year we looked at Proverbs, or two years ago, Proverbs chapter 1. This year we're looking at Proverbs chapter 2. Father knows best. <laughs> right. Some of you probably remember that between ah, 75 to 100 years ago, there was a television show called Father Knows Best. I know because I watched it for those 25 years while I was on Noah's Ark. There were quite a few family-friendly shows back then, right after I got off the Ark, but I'm told that they have all disappeared. Of course, the reason that I've been have to be told is because I haven't had a working television since the Great Flood. But the idea that Father Knows Best actually originated with God. You see, it's the fathers who have had to make the stupid mistakes and learn by their own experiences. If we fail to listen to the wisdom given to us by our fathers, we are doomed to make the same stupid mistakes that they made. If many generations of sons and daughters, because we have some of those here, listen to the wisdom gained from their fathers that was passed down from their fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers, they will be wise in their youth. Now, of course, some sons listen to their fathers and become wise, but some sons refuse to listen to their fathers and they become fools. Instead, they listen to their friends. They listen to social media. They listen to the internet, to movies, to newspapers, and to other fake news stories. When a man becomes a fool, he does stupid things, even on the national level. Rehoboam was a man like that. His father, Solomon, was the wisest man on earth at that time. Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs. His father taught him wisdom. In fact, his father left him a book of wisdom. But Rehoboam was a fool. We read about it after the death of Solomon, the last three verses of 1 Kings 11 and then chapter 12. And the rest of the acts of Solomon and all that he did and his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the acts of Solomon? And the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. And Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father. And Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his stead. Now chapter 12. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel come to Shechem to make him king. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt, that they sent and called him. And Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore make thou the grievous service of thy father, and his heavy yoke which he put upon us lighter, and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, Depart yet for three days, 
Then come again to me, and the people departed. And the king Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, and said, How do you advise that I may answer this people? And they speak unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men which they had been given him and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him and which stood before him. And he said unto them, What counsel give ye that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter. And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto the people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter to us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. And now, whereas my father did lay you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father chastened you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people roughly, and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him, and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Wherefore? king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord, that he might perform his saying, which the Lord spake by Ahijah the Shilonite, unto Jeroboam the son of Nebat. So when all Israel saw the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we an inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones, and he died. Therefore King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. Amen. Fathers, you may not only determine destinies for your sons, but you may see, if you are a fool, the turning away of many from the one who is the true son of David, of the house of David. Your failure may put you in the same camp as Rehoboam. There is an important reason that God teaches the principle that Father knows best. The reason is quite simple. You see, God is our Father in the spiritual realm. And so he has set human fathers in their incredibly responsible and accountable positions to represent him and to reflect him. Some men do a great job. Some men do a horrible job. He is our father, but notice what he says about the application in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Here are practical principles of living and in connection to the Heavenly Father. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. You've got it on the wall. 
And be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Now listen to verse 18. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. We have a father, and he knows best. Can you read it? I think you can read it from where you're sitting. Jesus himself told us to address God as our Father in what has been called the Lord's Prayer. But do you know how many times God is called Father in the New Testament? Just in the Gospels. Over 300 times. When God says something once, he's making a point. If he says it twice, you better sit up and listen. If he says it three times, you better be sweating it and sitting on the edge of your chair. If he says it over 300 times, he's trying to tell you something. Let me give you just a representative sample, just from the Gospel of Matthew. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven that you may be children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. Chapter 5. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them, otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. That thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. I mean, there's so many principles in each of these verses. I'm just showing you where the name Father shows up. But Jesus is teaching specific principles that relate between children and their fathers in each one of these verses. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what need ye have before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven. Verse 14, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you give not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father, which is in secret. And thy Father, notice each time it's thy Father too, not just the Father. Thy Father, thy Father, thy Father. Thy father. It applies to us as, as children of the heavenly Father. That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall to the ground without your Father? Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will also I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. Ooh, let me read that one again. Whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, is a nice guy. That's not what it says. It says, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Question, are you doing the will of your Father, which is in heaven? Jesus says that's the way to identify those who are his brothers and sisters and mothers. Hmm. 
Then shall the righteous shine forth as the son of the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly father hath not planted shall be rooted up. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you, that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Even so it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done of them of my Father which is in heaven. Do you understand how many clear promises, principles uh, are articulated by our Lord Jesus Christ in relation to the Father? This is just one gospel we look at. I haven't even looked at Mark or Luke or John. We'll not have time for that today. I'm just reading these things. Then we'll talk about principles. Even so it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Again, I say unto you, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done of them of my Father which is in heaven. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. And he saith unto them, ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. But of that day and of that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of this vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall give me presently more than twelve legions of angels? And then what you know is the Great Commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. I bet you never thought about it while you were reading through the Gospels. What an incredible emphasis Jesus puts on God the Father. And he's teaching us something about the responsibility of human fathers to reflect the one who is the Father. Uh, I wish we had time. So many wonderful verses. You know, we do a lot of study about the person and work of Christ. We do a lot of study about the person and work of the Holy Spirit. When was the last time you did an in-depth study on the Father? Have you ever done an in-depth study of the Father. I think you may have noticed that Jesus put a rather heavy emphasis on the Father. And as a result, men, God puts a heavy emphasis on those of us who are fathers. For he is our example of what a father is supposed to be like. The book of Proverbs is designed to teach immature, foolish, selfish, hormone-driven boys how to become wise, self-controlled, godly men. God has chosen to use hard-headed men to facilitate the process. In the process, it also teaches girls and parents how to choose the right kind of wise men to marry their daughters. And it teaches both boys and girls how to avoid wrong life choices that end in sorrow and destruction. We read some of that today in Proverbs chapter 2. Now Solomon warns his sons against the immoral woman. 
whose paths lead to death. Proverbs has four major divisions. In that, it covers four basic areas of instruction. The major divisions are these, chapters 1 through 9. Now, you've heard me say some of these things before, but that comprises what I call the hard work, hardware, or the framework around which all of the later specific details of instruction are grouped. The rest of the book is a set of software programs that fit the framework established in chapters 1 through 9. The first section begins with the key divisional words. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. That shows up again at the next division. Chapter 10 through 24 are the specific Proverbs given by Solomon, with some, some of which Solomon learned from David. So we see an intergenerational passing on. Because he talks about, my father taught me. Now he's trying to teach it to his sons. This is something that is supposed to be passed from father to son to son to son to son until our Lord returns. People, we live in a generation where the Christian men have failed. All the same statistics that apply to the pagan world around us on evil things apply in the church. On Friday, two days ago, I attended a very important meeting for public policy makers in the state of New Jersey. And we heard seven different speeches concerning Christians in our current political session and also concerning why Christians are failing in their responsibilities. One of the men <coughs> who stood up and spoke, spoke, and he's the director of a organization that deals with men who have addictions. One of the worst addictions in the church today is pornography. He said that 70% of Christians, that's Christian men, view pornography on a regular basis. 30% of Christian women view pornography on a regular basis. Don't you understand what that does to your sons and daughters? You're supposed to be passing wisdom to them. The practical things in that second section are things that Solomon learned from David and that he was trying to pass to his sons. The specific details in chapters 10 through 24 deal with specific life situations. We're put on notice that chapter 10 begins with specific individual proverbs in verse 1 with the same divisional words that started chapter 1. The Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. Then we get to chapters 25 through 30. These proverbs are interesting because they are not just dealing with the general prospects of life, but they're taken from the judicial, administrative, and other writings of Solomon that were culled out of Solomon's writings in the days of Hezekiah. It says so. This section is also specifically separated by its opening verse. Chapter 25 and verse 1 says, These are also proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. Very, very clear divisions when we get to the book of Proverbs. 
And each one has specific areas in which it is dealing to teach young men who are growing up, first in their earlier years, and then in their middle years, and as they get into positions in business, and positions in government, and positions in other areas of life. Proverbs is not a disorganized book. It is very systematic on every key area of life. Do you know who it is that God holds accountable for teaching these areas of wisdom to his children, especially to his sons? Because they're going to be the ones that God holds accountable for the next generation. And their sons are going to be the ones that are held accountable for the next generation. And the next generation. And the next generation. The final and fourth major division of the book of Proverbs is chapter 31. Chapter 31 is the capstone chapter of wisdom for the book. Did you ever wonder why that got put last instead of first? Solomon's teaching primarily his sons. And he's teaching them all the things of life and especially warning them about bad women. That's one of the major parts of Proverbs. It's over and over and over through many different chapters. And he tells you what happens to the young man who gets involved with the immoral woman. He tells you not only what it does to his body, where he describes the body rotting away and the guy saying, Oh man, I wish I had listened to my teachers in my youth. To the destruction of the soul. Proverbs 31 is the proverb dealing with the godly woman. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. Here the words are called a prophecy, not a set of proverbs like in the other three divisions. Prophetically, this section tells you in advance what kind of a life a young man will have who marries the right kind of a woman. In contrast to the man who marries the wrong kind of a woman, warned about in all the rest of the book of Proverbs. Now, within those four divisions of Proverbs, there are four basic areas of instruction. And I think I've talked to you in the past about the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is the accumulation of facts. Wisdom is the ability to apply the facts. That's in general terms. Biblically... Biblical knowledge is accumulation of facts from the Bible. Biblical wisdom is the ability to apply biblical facts from God's perspective to life. That's biblical wisdom. The accumulation of knowledge is a presupposition for each of the four areas of instruction. The question in Proverbs is, how do you interpret, how do you use how do you apply the facts to real life situations? That's wisdom. Learning facts, remember, relates to knowledge. Knowing how to apply the facts from the divine perspective is wisdom. That is what Solomon is trying to teach his sons to do. That's why God gave us the book of Proverbs and many other places what are called wisdom literature in Scripture. He gave it to us so that fathers could pass it to their sons. Apart from our Lord Jesus Christ, Solomon was the wisest man who ever walked the face of the earth. And what he wrote was not merely his ideas, but it was inspired by God. Solomon had asked for wisdom. And God blessed him for that. He said, you didn't ask for power, you didn't ask for money, you didn't ask for all these other things, you asked for wisdom, so I'm going to give you those other things too. Because I'll give you wisdom so you'll know how to use them. James tells us, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith. You know what happens if you don't ask in faith? James tells you. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is as a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Now listen to what James says. For let not that man think that he should receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. He's a flip-flop. 
If you don't have wisdom, you are a flip-flop. If you never bother to ask God for wisdom, if you make your decisions on your own, you are a flip-flop. You're driven with the wind and waves and you're tossed and turned and you're not going to get answers to any of your other prayer requests. He says, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. You better ask for wisdom. Because God does hold you accountable. A double-minded man, well, I think I'll do this. No, well, I think I'll do this. Well, uh, I think this is a pretty good idea over here. And you never bother to ask God. You never bother to look into his word. You never say, are there principles in here that would apply to my situation? Lord, this is what I see in your word. Show me some light so that I'll understand how to apply it in my current life situation. Wisdom. Proverbs 4, 7 says, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting get understanding. Now, if that's the principal thing, why aren't you following it? Why aren't you chasing it as hard as you can? We read that in, in, in Proverbs chapter 2. He says you've got to search for it like silver. You've got to hunt for it like hid treasures. I mean, you've got to go after it with all your heart and soul and strength and mind. You want wisdom and nothing else. You will not be satisfied until God gives you wisdom. And then you discover that's the key to all these other areas that you thought you were so worried about. Wisdom. A father is supposed to teach his sons and his daughters wisdom. Teach them what kind of women not to become. Teach them the kind of man that they should try to find as a husband. A man who is wise. Not merely a man who is powerful or rich or handsome. You know, or seductive. Or all the other girls think he's pretty cool. That's not what you're looking for, girls. You want a man who is wise. Wise in the things of Christ. Wise in the way he lives his life. Wise in the way he always seeks the will of God. He always walks by faith. He's a man of powerful prayer. He's a godly man. He's a man who's not motivated by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. He's a humble man. He's a kind man. He's a consistent man. He's a faithful man. Girls need to study Proverbs, too, to find out the kind of man God is trying to develop into a wise man. That's the man you want as a husband. And then God gives you a whole chapter to tell you what kind of a wife you should be. Very succinctly, Proverbs chapter 10, verses 10 through 31. Who can find a virtuous woman? Girls, you're very, very rare if you fit that chapter. Who can find one? You look and 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 you can't find any. You look around the world today, where are they? Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She's like the merchant ship. She bringeth food from afar. Oh, girls, study Proverbs 31. That's the kind of woman you need to become. And if you become that kind of a woman, God will lead you to the right kind of man. God only had to take one chapter to tell you all what kind of a woman to be. He had to take 30 chapters to tell the boys what kind of men they ought to be. It tells you something about the hard-headedness of men and what slow learners we are. But when you put it together, young people especially, it'll tell you what you should be like and what kind of partner for life you should be praying for and not being moved by the things of the flesh being moved by the word of God and the spirit of God sensing the character qualities that Jesus says are important 
in the Beatitudes, for example, does the man that I'm interested in have those character qualities? There's so much that a father has to teach his sons. I look back and I tried very hard. I used Proverbs as a template for teaching my boys. I use Proverbs as a template for teaching my girls. And the longer I study Proverbs, the more I realize I missed. And I've been reading the book of Proverbs every day since I was about 12 years old. A chapter a day. On the first day of the month, I read chapter one. And I stop and think about it, I meditate on it. On the second day of the month, I read chapter two. Some months have 31 days, so I get through it a chapter at a time. But in the day that there's only 30 days in the month, I read two chapters the last day. I've done that for years and years and years. And I keep finding new things. And I pray that God will transform my life into the kind of man that's described as the godly man in Proverbs. I'll be the kind of man that Jesus describes in the Beatitudes. I'll be the kind of man that the heroes of faith were in Hebrews 11. We're all sinners even the heroes of faith. But they had a focus. They had a goal to becoming the men and women of God that God wanted them to be. They weren't focused on earth. They were focused on a heavenly country. They were focused on the one who had called them. Are you focused on Jesus? You will stand before him. And you will give an account. You'll give an account for what you heard today as to whether or not you started to apply the things that you heard in this message. Because you will give an account. What kind of an account will it be? Well, I'm nowhere near done with this message, but at least I'll just summarize it for you. 21 points. I'll read the points for you. Well, first of all, I'll give you the four main areas. The book of Proverbs talks about wisdom, talks about justice, talks about judgment, talks about equity. That's Proverbs 1.3. So those are the four key areas that it covers. Then there are 21 different areas of life that the book of Proverbs deals with. It deals with friends, right and wrong, areas of danger that alert you to the wrong types of friends. It ta talks about the wise use of money, God's principles versus worldly principles. It talks about the wise use of material goods and resources for eternal purposes. It talks about integrity, that means honesty, truthfulness, reliability, strength against compromise. It talks about knowing and doing God's will, in other words, a right relationship with God. It talks about the wise use of skills, that is, issues related to diligent work. It talks about the wise use of time. It talks about the control of the tongue. It talks about accountability versus excuse making. America is full of excuse makers. Life perspective it talks about. That's our worldview. What's important and what's valuable and what is not important or valuable. It talks about the seven deadly sins. Pride versus humility. Greed versus generosity. Anger versus forgiveness. Sloth versus diligence. Envy versus kindness. Gluttony versus self-control. Lust versus love. It talks about attitudes and motives, both good and bad. Those are many of those are dealt with in the book of Proverbs. You know, we almost never talk about attitudes and motives. We only talk about the actions of people. Or if they say bad, really bad things, then we talk about words. The book of Proverbs doesn't just talk about those things. It talks about attitudes and motives. It talks about fools. In fact, there are multiple kinds of fools that are dealt with. Different words even are used for them in the book of Proverbs. It talks about personal self-control in all situations. Many, many, many are listed uh, in Proverbs. I mean, self-control ties, for example, to alcohol, which is dealt with in the book of Proverbs. It talks about leadership character qualities, spiritual gifts, natural talents, alertness to opportunities, decisive action. 
book of Proverbs has something for you in it. I know it has something for me. I cry almost every time I read it and realize how far, far short I am. But God, the Holy Spirit, lives in me. And if you're a believer, he lives in you. And he opens your eyes and he says, okay, Christian, today your lesson is. And he gives it to me. I say, oh, Lord, I've been failing on that for all these years. I've got to pass it on. I've got to pass it on. Oh, I praise God that he's given me a place to pass it on in a church. I still pass it on. I talk to my children. A lot of them already wish me happy Father's Day today. I talk about it to my grandchildren. I wrote within the last week, I think, eight birthday cards. I have a lot of family birthdays in the month of June. And in every one of them, I was encouraging mostly my little grandsons uh, to love the Lord Jesus Christ and obey daddy and mommy because that makes Jesus happy and writing simple things that they can understand but which teach biblical principles and they're being reaffirmed not just by the parents who are there glowering over them but by their granddad who is the one who they always run up to me and give me a hug and a kiss and they're always so excited to see me the guy who they know really really loves them they don't understand discipline is love yet but the guy who really loves them and gives them nice stuff and he's telling them to obey daddy and mommy yes Dear people, this is intergenerational. And Americans have failed to pass it on. And as a result, our country is coming under God's judgment. Please be with us tonight. I'm going to have to close with that. But it should be self-evident that a man must know these things before he can teach these things to his sons and to his daughters as he trains them to be the kind of man they will be and the kind of man they will want to marry and the kind of men they must avoid being or avoid marrying at all costs. For a father to teach all these things, he must know them first. And that requires diligent study and practical application of life so that he can set the example so that he can set the example for his sons to follow and for his daughters to know what they should look for. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word and for its power. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The words of our Lord Jesus. Our sanctification is tied to the word of God which alone we can trust as truth. Father, I pray for this congregation and for those who are listening. I pray especially for the men that you will make us into men of God. The kind of men that are unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Make us into men of God. Help us to train our sons to be men of God. Even a wise father can fail in this, for Rehoboam is a perfect example of that. He was a fool, and he had a super wise father who wrote it down, who systematized it, who made it simple to learn, who made it understandable, and yet Rehoboam decided he was going to listen to his friends. He was into the modern mindset, the modern culture. Father, help us to learn from the mistakes of our fathers so that we might learn wisdom as they give it to us. And Father, I pray for the young ladies in this church that you will cause them to study the book of Proverbs so that they might know the kind of man that you would have them to marry as they become the kind of woman you want them to be. Again, Father, we commit this to you and pray that you might encourage and bless the hearts of all those who are here present today, that each one of us might with joy and rejoicing look forward to the Lord Jesus Christ, to his return, and that we might not be ashamed at his coming. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.